Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Kathy Boffman McLeod, director of the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council. I'm very pleased to be moderating today's session, a panel brainstorm on credit and climate risk, applying data to lending decisions. We have a great set of panelists today. We are going to be delving deeply into conversations about the impact that climate-related risks are having on business and how management can respond, some really actionable things you'll take away today. Um, and we'll be talking about the best ways to measure physical and transition risk. We're going to be touching on litigation risk, and um, we're also going to have a little fun. And so I hope you are comfortable and ready to ride with us. Um, we have some fantastic panelists. We're going to keep it moving really quickly, only about 40 minutes. And so um, bios are available in the platform. Um, we have Craig Davies, Head of Climate Resilience Investments at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, EBRD. It's good to see you, Craig. Been a while. Um, Emily Mazzacarati from um, Moody's Climate Solutions. She's their global head. Lots of action at Moody's lately. Um, Kristen Bode, who is co head of Pan European Private Debt at Muzinich and Company. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to kick it off with an opening question for the panel. And that is what is the state of climate risk disclosure today? Give us your best shot in um, in a short, snappy style, and we'll keep it moving. Let me start with Emily. Over to you. Well, if you think of climate disclosures as a journey, I would say we've put our shoes on. We've started plotting the maps. <laughs> we've packed our snacks, but that's about how far along we are. We have a really long way. The final destination keeps changing. The journey itself keeps changing in terms of what uh, disclosures are needed. What are we disclosing for what end? Um, so it's it's going to be a long journey, and we're getting ready, but we're certainly just at the beginning. Emily, thank you. That is a good way to kick us off. So uh, let's go next to Craig. Uh, thanks, Kathy. I, I think Emily's dead right. I, I think uh, we're still in the foothills uh, of this process of moving towards you know more consistent and more. Uh, more widespread action on climate risk disclosure. Uh, there is a lot more to be done. Uh, the current situation is patchy. Um, we see very different levels of progress um, in different markets, in different uh, respects. I think it's fair to say that um, on physical climate risk, we're not even in the foothills. We're at an earlier stage. The patchiness is, is more intense, if you like, in the physical climate risk space. And there's perhaps particularly more work to do there uh, to hopefully keep up with the, 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 the sort of greater level of progress that we see in some respects when it comes to carbon-related disclosures. I'd like to just make one additional comment too, which is about emerging markets, because I think when we look at advanced markets versus emerging markets, we see another big disparity. And I think, uh, you know, making sure that we support emerging markets in joining the journey, being part of this shift internationally towards better climate risk assessment and disclosure is something that needs particular attention. Great. Good, good focus. Um, and Kristen, over to you. Thank you. Um, I fear I have to agree. Uh, the market uh, we are active in is lending to small to medium sized companies. So companies between five and 20 million EBTA. So it's a specific sub segments of companies. We have just gone through the exercise of um, talking to all of our portfolio companies to find out what exactly are they measuring on the climate um, perspective. And it's really interesting, but the answers are extremely diverse. Some of the smaller companies are on top of things, uh, measuring a lot of data points, and others have barely thought about the, the subject. So um, definitely a long way to go, at least for some of the players. Great, thank you. Well, I think I wanna talk for a minute about decision-making and how, um, how investors and companies make decisions based on data. So it's decision making based on data. The data is imperfect, and as Kristen said, in a wide range of um, you know quality and robustness. Um, and then Craig, you've talked about qualitative versus quantitative. And could I hear from each of you about the state of data and how do you make decisions? We need, you know we need to make decisions and all sorts of decisions based on what you have in front of you. And there are um, workarounds. You can make estimations. And Kristen, you've talked about how um, you have to draw some, um, you make some estimates from what you can from 
um, companies in terms of their GHG footprint, but there's so much more to it. So maybe I'll go backwards this time and start with Kristen and ask, can you talk about the quality of data and then how do you move ahead with or without that quality data in decision making? Yeah, uh, the benefit we have in our world is that um, typically we engage with a company one to one. So we are not part of a white syndicate. So we have the ability to ask questions directly to the management. And that gives you a lot more information than just being sent, you know, printouts of data or anything of that. So it's really, as was said before, it's obviously asking quantitative questions, but then adding this qualitative aspects of how the company is thinking about it, what is the plan for the next five years, um, and all those types of things. So, you know, that that gives a holistic picture, I believe, on which we can um, provide our internal scores quite well. Yeah, good, good, thanks. Um, Craig, let me go to you. Thoughts on that? So I think that, you know, there are a range of different data sources and data types that, that companies and financial firms can use to make uh, judgments and assessments on, on, on climate risk. They can be external data sources, for example, outputs of climate models, uh, publicly available data sets could be, you know, publicly available scenarios, for example, the NGFS scenarios. They could be uh, a whole range of external data sources that can be used. And they can be really useful, I mean, particularly for kind of a first pass of understanding where in your portfolio does climate risk lie, which sectors, which geographies, kind of a screening, if you like. But at some point, you need to move on to the kind of endogenous information that comes from the inside of your operations and from the inside of your, uh, of your portfolio or your client base. And, and that is where we hit upon the subject of disclosures. Because if you're a financial institution, at some point, you're going to have to try to extract or obtain information from your real economy clients about you know, the physical reality of what's happening inside their businesses, inside their operations in relation to climate risk. So uh, when it comes to disclosures, um, there is a lot of work to be done on improving the consistency and the quality and the comparability of climate related disclosures. We've seen phenomenal advances in the past half a decade, things like the TCFD, for example, but there's still much further to go. I think as well, um, you know, unfortunately, in the context of the climate crisis, we don't have the luxury of 10 years to uh, wait for the perfect data set to be built up. We haven't got time to build the perfect evidence base. So we've got to grasp the nettle and find ways of making robust decisions based on less than perfect data. And that means being forward looking. That means using, for example, scenarios. That means robust decision making. And I think also uh, recognizing uh, some of the limitations and the, 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 the constraints um, on the quantitative approaches and, and to be kind of a, maybe a bit uh, realistic in our expectations of how far we can go today uh, in terms of quantitative approaches and recognizing that they may be qualitative or semi-quantitative approaches that may enable us to bridge this gap uh, you know, in this point in time where we are now, where we have less than perfect data. Great, great, thank you. I like the grasp the nettle. That's um, quotable, I wrote that down. That sounds very painful. <laughs> I, I was actually gonna, gonna pick up on it too because that is, that is a great way to describe the issue, right? If you think about the, le the leap um, of faith, right, that it requires to uh, try to obtain and uh, digest forward-looking assessments about how a company thinks they're going to deal with climate risk 5, 10, 20, 50 years down the road. Will that company still exist? Do they know what they're going to be doing? It's really hard to do forecasting, even just a few years out from a really business bottom-up perspective. So um, really trying to anticipate and having credible, actionable, science-grounded plans on how you may reach certain targets, how you're going to decarbonize is is challenging and then I and I love that expression. I mean just looking at carbon footprint, um this is the most basic data and, and yet it's not universally reported even in large sort of uh, large cap uh, publicly listed companies, we're looking at maybe 60% reporting rate for scope three, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little more for scope one, two. And then once you get down into SMEs, if you get down into uh, emerging markets, as, uh, as uh, Craig and Kristen were saying, then they did, that data is just not there. And so you can approximate, you can try to get it directly from, the, um, from your counterparties, but it's going to be challenging either way. 
Yeah, that that is uh, sobering. Um, let me ask about the net zero commitments that we're seeing. Um, you all, in preparation for the panel, um, a couple of you touched on net zero and the um, commitments that we're seeing all over. And as we uh, walk our way toward to the COP26, which is just eight weeks away, um, how do you see those commitments and what's under the hood of the net zero commitments? Just maybe share thoughts about that. I'll go backwards again, Emily. I'll, I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, we see a lot of inspiring commitments. Um, we hope there isn't too much virtue signaling that is also going to be the next CEO's problem. Um, and so I think the question, the way we look at it as um, an analytical firm is how do we help our clients understand um, whether all those net zero commitments actually mean the same thing. You're going to have companies mm -hmm. that include different scope. They may express their targets in carbon intensity terms. They may exclude certain parts of their business from their target. Uh, for example, certain regions or affiliates that may be very uh, high emitting companies if you look mm -hmm. at some of the oil and gas companies. Um, so there's some simple... Um, standardization comparability that needs to happen so that one can look at a company's net zero target and understand um, what it really means. And then there is um, a, a, a lot of uh, grain of salts to be had around how is that going to be reached. And some companies have released quite detailed plans. Um, most others are working on it. Uh, and those that have released those plans, sometimes you look at it and you see that a lot of the expected reductions come from downstream changes in customer behavior or come from uh, scaling of technologies that are that have not reached the scaling point today. And so there's going to be a lot of unpacking those commitments and the ways they're supposed to be reached and to really understand how far we're on the way and what else needs to what else needs to happen. But I don't want to underestimate the importance of having actually all those companies and banks and investors. We've got over a quarter of the global banking system saying, yes, we're going to go net zero. So that's a big deal. And it's okay to not have the solutions out, but it's also important to bring transparency and to make sure that there isn't too much greenwashing happening in there. Yeah, well said, well said. Uh, Craig, thoughts? Like Emily, I mean, I, I think it's great that we're seeing so many large firms, both financial and non-financial, sending the signal that this matters and sending the signal that this is important and sending the signal that this is something that they intend to do something about at the highest level. However, I also think that uh, that needs to be complemented by some serious methodological work. And I think we shouldn't underestimate, you know, as you say, under the bonnet, how complex uh, and how much time, well, resources, well, we haven't got the time, so we need to put in the resources even more so, uh, to work out the methodologies for uh, taking meaningful action towards these goals in a way, as Emily says, that is transparent, because that transparency is really important. Um, at EBRD, like uh, the other multilateral development banks, we haven't made a net zero commitment, but we have committed to aligning our operations with the Paris Agreement, and which means aligning our operations with low carbon and climate resilient development pathways. Um, and at the moment, I can tell you that we're, we're, we're immersed in really detailed methodological work of working out exactly what that means and how do we ensure that every financial commitment we make is aligned with those low carbon and climate resilient pathways. So we should keep our eyes open to the, the need for this serious method, methodological work. And one last point, um, it's even more complex when you have financing operations without defined use of proceeds. So it's one thing when you're financing mm. firms, you know those firms, you know what they do. You can talk to them about their assets and their operations. But there are all different sorts of financing. It could be equity. It could be working capital. It could be intermediated financing where you're lending to downstream banks, where it's really difficult or even impossible to define ex ante the use of proceeds of the financing being provided. So where we have those more complex uh, intermediated and, and non-direct financing flows, this sort of methodological work is really complex. So great that firms are making the commitment, but I think we really need to pool knowledge and expertise and allocate the resources to defining the methodologies that give the results and mm -hmm. the transparency. Yeah, here, here. Great, thank you. Kristen, what's yes, under the bonnet? I, I like that. 
Yeah, I mean, even in our universe of small to medium sized companies, there is a good number of companies who have committed to net zero um, by 2030, uh, which I found impressive. Um, again, you know, even in our conversations, it was very clear that every company approached it very differently. So fully agreed that there ideally should be some underlying methodology. Um, what struck me as well in those conversations is that very often this has triggered thoughts about innovation, i.e. finding new technologies, specifically in industry heavy um, or, you know, metal producing companies. Very often um, it's all connected with a, you know, technological innovation. And, you know, I think that's a great thing that that is driving companies to actually innovate. Um, so that, that was just one thing I picked up from two of our portfolio companies. Great, thank you. So um, let's talk about decision making for a minute in the different um, dimensions of uh, the climate risk and looking at, you've got transition risk and the scenarios, you've got physical risk and um, the, the sort of um, the quantification of the impacts of climate on your physical assets. I mean, I think everyone on the, um, in the session today knows um, these terms, but, and then, talking a little bit about litigation risk um, and and even how they go together. You know, we, th we think about the quality of data in each of them and the use of the scenarios and the assumptions made in those scenarios. And then, as we say in the, you know, the title of the session, you've got to make a credit decision. And, you know, Craig, from your perspective at EBRD and emerging economies, the, I mean, this is, um, there's, there's a, it's complex. There's a lot of stuff happening <laughs> around the um, the data that's available um, and the the interface of the transition risk with the physical risk and then making a decision. Um, I do want to ask uh, perhaps Kristen to just comment on litigation risk because it's one that we don't talk about as much as we do the others. And there's probably a reason for that, that we're still really focused on, you know, we're still lacing up our shoes, as, as Emily said, um, on getting that data. But Kristen, could you just uh, talk about your perspective on litigation risk and how you look at it and the role that you play. Yeah, um, again, it's it's just from from our perspective as as fund managers. Um, obviously, there are certain uh, statements we need to make in terms of um, qualifications of the fund, SFR, SFDR, and so on. So, in that regard, we obviously want to avoid to be accused of greenwashing at some point further down the road. Um, and at this point where all the definitions of what we need to deliver in which format to which extent is very unclear, it's, you know, going down potentially a slippery road. And obviously we haven't seen what potential litigation could come up in that respect. So, you know, it's a, it's a topic we discuss internally between, um, you know, our ESG team, um, legal compliance all the time. It's, it's very relevant at this point in time. Yeah. So for um, Emily and Craig, I might ask when you look at the state, you know, we opened by saying the state of the state of um, climate risk uh, disclosure. Let's let's separate it a little bit. And could you talk about for folks listening um, in the session, what's the state of the state of transition risk and how confident are you in how it's um, progressing, and then the same for the physical risk, because they're very different ways that we go about assessing them. Uh, maybe Craig, I'll start with you if you wouldn't mind talking about the difference for just a minute. Um, it's it's a tough question to answer because, as we discussed earlier, you know we're still in the foothills, so we don't know how difficult yeah. those mountains are going to be to climb yet because we haven't reached them. So it, it's it's difficult to to sort of. Um, uh, I think uh, in, in a sort of uh, with any kind of great certainty to to, to give a, a sort of um, a very sort of precise answer to your question, but but I, I think that um, you know you can almost think of uh, uh, with physical climate risk, it, it seems to be at least uh, in some experience really hard to get started. Once you get started, um, you know it's like a curve, that, a sort of convex curve. You know that it's really hard to get started but once you get moving you collect more data you know that, that we have found that that really in the early days how on earth do you do this what are you looking for what do you measure what are these physical climate risks how do we define them how do we look for them in our portfolio once you start doing that you know it, 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 and start collecting a, a database um things you know 
mm-hmm. potentially get easier. With uh, transition risk, maybe it's more like the concave curve, you know, mm-hmm. that you start off as you get into more complexity. Uh, you know, you might think, oh, it's fine. I've got my scope one emissions. I've got my scope two. And then you think, oh, scope three. Okay, and forward looking metrics. Oh, dear. And then, you know, you start. So as the complexity uh, rises, the the, 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 the challenges, um, you know, become more apparent. And, and uh, you know, it becomes clear that uh, we still have a lot more work to do. So I, I think, um, uh, you know, the, and again, physical climate, physical climate risk and, and carbon transition risk, as we mentioned earlier, being at different levels of advancement. And I think now um, it's great to see more progress happening with physical climate. It's great to see uh, more financial and non-financial firms beginning to disclose at least basic information about physical climate risk. It's great to see financial supervisors and standard setters beginning to you know, state more explicitly that they expect to see information disclosed on physical climate risk. These are all really helpful steps. And I hope that we're in this positive phase on physical climate risk of, of the momentum building. Uh, looking across at carbon transition risk, we've had this period of, of a lot of activity and, and we now see maybe moving up to the next level of more complexity, as I say, with things like forward looking metrics and you know portfolio, portfolio warming potential, et cetera. Uh, where we're now moving into a, a stage now of the next level of complexity, which is throwing up a, a new level of, of challenges. Mm, thank you. And, you know, Emily, for you, I might ask a little bit about the models um, and maybe focus on physical risk. Are there, When people come to make decisions about how to assess it, there are lots of models to choose from and it can be um, a lot to face. Maybe you could um, break it down a little bit for us. Sure, that's that's certainly a big part of the of the issue. Um, so there's the models, and then there's another piece that I want to touch upon, which is we don't have the benefit of 15, 20 years of thinking about those issues the way we have with carbon. And so um, some of the thinking, in my view, hasn't fully matured yet in terms of understanding transmission channels. So let me go back to the models first. Um, there's a wide range of models that you can use, and they're all complex, and they don't talk very well to each other. Uh, you have models that give you very deep detailed uh, projections decades out on how the environment is going to change because of climate change. And then you have CAT models that give you probabilistic assessment of what might happen next year in terms of of an event. You have weather models, you have seasonal models. And so understanding physical impacts in a time frame that's relevant for the financial sector is very challenging because, in fact, the short-term Drivers can be more driven by cyclical phenomena like El Nino, La Nina. Um, it can be driven by long-term impacts of climate change, but that are not necessarily uh, projected at that scale. Um, and there is uncertainty. The long-term uncertainty is policy-driven, but it's also science-driven. And the short-term uncertainty is largely science-driven. How quickly are things going to degrade? Are we going to have three big storms next year or not? Um, So it can be really hard for folks to find the right data in the right place in a way that they can apply, understand, and then in a way that can then feed into an understanding of the financial and economic impact. And this is where we also lack data because we lack understanding of how weather and climate have driven uh, economic impacts in the past. And even the past is not going to be a good predictor of the future because we have more frequent, more intense events where we might have recovered in the past after an event. We're going to have three in a row and we might not recover from that event the same way, whether it's a corporation or a city. So there's a lot of complexity related to physical climate change that hasn't really been well modeled. And it gets even more complicated if you really think about all the possible transmission channels. So it's not just the storm, it's potential changes in regulation. It can be litigation risk for physical risk as a transmission channel. If you think of one of the biggest um, bankruptcies that we have related to climate, it's PG&E and wildfires, right? Um, And so, (laughs) so it really comes together. And then all the transmission channels thinking of climate change as a driver of uh, food shortages and water stress and potential conflicts and mass migrations, that has all kind of indirect impacts that are also really hard to factor in. Wow, that's the, um, that's the uplifting part of today's session. <laughs> to the party, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so um, let's talk about the urgency for a minute. I mean, we've, that's come up in three or four of your responses to these questions. You know, we do not have time. We are out of time. And as you said, Emily, we've been looking at transition risk and, and decarbonization for 
um, for decades and versus now facing this physical risk. Could I ask each of you to just comment on that? You know, what are some of the, the hacks, the workarounds, the tricks that you might see? And tricks are probably not a good word when you're talking about <laughs> climate risk disclosure. So never mind that word. But what are some of the ways that we can accelerate our understanding and um, build reliable disclosure framework so that people feel comfortable, but um, but we're still meeting the demand, which is just immense. Uh, maybe Craig. Um, I'll, I'll do what I can to, to try to maybe hopefully partially answer this question. I, I, I think that one really practical barrier that um, is out there is an awful lot of people just really don't know what to disclose. They don't know what's relevant. Um, I want to say people, I'm talking about firms, financial and non-financial mm -hmm. firms. I've already talked about differences between different types of markets, which is a factor. Mm -hmm. But but mm -hmm. just looking at, at that a bit closely, you know, I think having better um, clarity on what are useful disclosures, what information is decision useful to firms, to investors, to regulators. Um, I don't feel that um, firms at present have enough information about what makes a decision useful disclosure. Um, we are in, um, uh, uh, when it comes to climate disclosures, and I think sustainability disclosures more generally, uh, we are in a situation now where we have a kind of kaleidoscope of different sustainability disclosure uh, reporting frameworks. I mean, we all know the kind of uh, alphabet soup of acronyms that we have, TCFD, SASB, GRI, IIRC, I could go on, ESG. Um, uh, and, and this is an issue. And when we talk to our clients about uh, climate-related disclosures, they're often confused. And they say, well, you know, there's this TCFD thing, but we were using CDP. Was that wrong? I mean, what, sh what should we do now? So, I, and I think the same, uh, having better clarity on what firms should be doing would be a really helpful step. I think we're seeing um, some interesting moves in this direction. Obviously, there's the proposal for a sustainability standards board underneath the IFRS. There's... Uh, um, work by the G20 on a sustainable finance working group, all essentially uh, addressing the same issue, which is uh, the, 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 the question of whether there is too much disparity in sustainability, including climate disclosure frameworks uh, across geographies and across markets. So um, uh, two things there, though. I mean, one, I really hope that physical climate features uh, appropriately in this work. Um, I think it's really important that we build, if there is going to be a sustainability standards board, let's make sure it pays adequate attention to physical climate. If we are going to see G20 recommendations on sustainability uh, reporting and, and, and financing uh, operations, let's make sure it pays adequate attention to physical climate. And I think there's then this perennial problem of when is the right time to start standardizing? I mean, do we let the thousand flowers bloom? Uh, you know, let good market practices evolve, the good ones will prosper and the maybe not so credible ones will die off? Um, or is there a need to be more interventionist and start intervening earlier so that we have, you know, from an, an earlier stage, more comparability? So um, I, I think your question is really tough to answer. Um, I, my, my partial uh, sort of uh, response there is that having better definitions and helping uh, a mm -hmm. much wider number of market participants to understand and use those definitions would be a helpful step. Right. No, that's very solid. Thank you. Very clear. Kristen, how about you? Yeah, we're obviously down um, on the ground and working directly with companies. So actually, a good part of our job is um, engaging with those companies. And they very often have questions which... Um, need to be answered in that regard as so we are trying to help them. But obviously there's kind of in our um, segment of the market organizations like the European Leverage Finance Association, which is issuing fact sheets, ESG fact sheets, which is helping companies to understand which questions they should answer to, you know, go down the first step um, in terms of reporting. So I think efforts are being made. Um, it obviously would be great if there's an even more overarching system um, uh, to unify the various approaches in potentially different market segments. So, Emily, the question is, are there some workarounds or some um, hacks that people can uh, consider given the urgency of, you've, you've all cited that we need to move quickly, we don't have decades to really study how to do this. And so how can we get around the need for that research and that time when we really don't have time? So what are some of the things you might recommend? 
Sure. So as, as, uh, as an American, I'll say we need to work and chew gum at the same time. We need to try <laughs> things and then we need to learn by doing. Um, w- one thing that I wanted to flag, too, is that I see disclosures as a mean to an end rather than uh, the goal in and of itself. Um, what disclosures are meant to bring is transparency. The transparency is what's going to enable investors and banks to price risks uh, a- appropriately. And that is the thing that's going to then help unlock financing for transition and for adaptation. Because if the risk isn't priced, then there's no business case to be made to invest in and compensate for uh, for these expected risks. And so um, that's that's one of the way we need to think about disclosures. The, um, the uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. okay. So we've got about eight minutes left and I wanted to give you all a chance to make your best um, advice, you know, give advice. And if somebody who is um, part of the session today is just getting started, what advice do you have for them and how do they better position themselves for uh, the the credit decision that they're looking for in regard to um, transition and physical risk? So let me um, start with Kristen. I'll just go in order. Yeah, it's. Um, I guess I, I can answer it on on two levels. Number one, advice to companies, and then I guess advice to more on the on the fund side. So in terms of companies, you know, it's it's super important if you are not active in in terms of finding the data and um, focusing on those matters um, that might present a risk to your future financing sources. So, you know, it's absolutely important to be up to speed and it will help you develop, as I mentioned before, with regard to innovation, you know, might be pushed forward faster than otherwise and so on and so forth. Um, And as said before, you know, those fact sheets and other measures, um, there's, there's things which can help you find the things you should be thinking about and advisors obviously as well. Then from a fund management perspective, um, it's a, a topic which we have spent more and more time on over the last, I would say, um, one to two years. Um, and again, there's, I would say, a lack of standardization at the moment. So everybody is doing their own thing. It's a little bit similar to net zero. Um, you know, everybody has their internal methodologies, uh, but there's not really a standardization. So again, guidance on that would, would really be helpful as well to make sure we are all presenting the same things and talking about the same things and there's no greenwashing taking place. Excellent. Excellent. And Emily, I'll come back to you and then Craig. Sure. Um, okay. My advice would be one, don't do this alone. There is a lot of helpful guidance and support from industry associations, from uh, think tank and um, and non-for-profits that have been in the space, all the alphabet soup that Craig was mentioning earlier. Those are people that have guidance and standards and, uh, and uh, different types of services to to help you make your way through this. Uh, Number two would be don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's better to do something, even if it's incomplete, imperfect. Uh, There's actually a lot of thinking right now around can we um, can we be explicit about the level of quality of the data that's being disclosed so that we can see how the quality of the data improves over time, right? So you could almost rate the score the data itself, the quality of the data. Um, and then my, my third advice is going to be don't wait to actually take action in terms of starting to look for emission reductions, looking for opportunities to uh, build resilience, including to physical risks. Um, those are not risks that are 50 years down the road. There are uh, there's things that are happening today and now. Great. Thank you. Craig? So firstly, I mean, I, I fully agree with all the points made by Kirsten and Emily just there. I think I'd add one more, which uh, my piece of advice would be prioritize transparency. Uh, be transparent, not only about the information that you're disclosing, but the assumptions that you're making, the methodologies that you're using, they all need to be disclosed. We need transparency throughout the system. Be transparent about what you don't know. Be transparent about what you can't measure. Because I think um, in this environment where we have less than perfect data, we have um, a, a range, a, 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 a great range, of a diversity of, of um, uh, you know, standards and disclosure frameworks. Um, we have huge uncertainties at many different levels in terms of 
how climate change is going to unfold and how it's going to affect economies and value chains and firms and financial institutions. So be explicit about these uncertainties. And again, the transparency is absolutely key. There's growing concern about greenwashing. Uh, transparency is vital for giving uh, investors, markets, the whole financial system, um, the, the clarity and the certainty um, that, you know, this, by, by showing how the information is being generated as well as what the information is. Right. Good, good. So, so much of the conversation that we have around climate risk is the risk, risk, risk. Can you all, in just maybe 30 to 45 seconds of an answer, what's on the other side of all the good behaviors and all the good transparencies? Just show them the promised land and, you know, 40 seconds of what does good, uh, transparent climate risk disclosure um, what's the prize on the other side of this journey once the, your shoes are laced and we've climbed the mountain and we are there? Um, what's the, what does it feel like? What is it, what's the benefit? Um, uh, Emily, how about you? <laughs> I suppose you get it. a rise in hormones that makes you feel good, but um, we're just <laughs> joking aside. The, uh, I, I think what you're going to find in that journey is that it helps with a number of things across the board beyond climate. There's governance, uh, there's management, there's energy efficiency, there's uh, engagement opportunities with employees. Um, there's opportunities to manage uh, risks more broadly or improve processes by trying to build resilience. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, but also, I, we, we haven't touched on it, there are opportunities for a lot of companies in terms of new markets, new technologies, new product, financial products for investors or for banks. Um, the, the EBRD, Craig, has been doing fantastic work in that field and piloting some, uh, some financing mechanisms. So um, I, I think Coming at it, there, it's not bad to benefit from climate change and climate risk. The market in, in general is needed to bring new products, new solutions to the market. And we need to put our heads towards that as well and not just in a risk uh, mindset. Great. Thank you. Uh, Craig, yeah, opportunities. That's good. Let's, let's hear about that. Uh, I think it's a pity in a way that we came to this at the end of our discussion. Um, so there's a lot that we could say about opportunities, but given the time I'll, I'll be uh, focused, I, you know, I, I'd like to mention access to capital and access to markets. And I think there was a time when we would have talked to our clients about these things as being sort of almost theoretical. In theory, if you de demonstrate good practice on, practices on climate risk disclosure, you may in time enjoy better access to markets and you may in time uh, enjoy better access to uh, capital, but I think they're no longer theoretical. It's happening, you know, and we see this. You know, it, it's it's real. It's happening now. Uh, you know, um, we are seeing investors putting down very clear demands on um, climate-related disclosures and evidence of at least efforts to start assessing and managing physical climate risk. And we we're seeing this in the market where we operate. You know, we are seeing firms saying. We've realized if we want to safeguard our access to capital, we've got to start doing something because otherwise we will start to be shut out. Same with access to markets. It's, it's happening. It's real. I mean, look, for example, at the, um, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that the EU is putting in place. And this is real. It's happening. I mean, this is triggering all kinds of action uh, with firms realizing that if they don't start to develop the capacities and the skills for understanding what's going on in their business operations, how carbon intensive are they, can they disclose this information in meaningful, incredible ways, yeah. that they're going to lose market access. So uh, I'm being really quite short term here. There's much more to talk about yeah. opportunities, but these are short term things that matter today. That's exciting. Kristen, uh, just a moment of your thought, yeah. please. Yeah. Um, not much to add. You know, we as a capital provider, obviously, are very much, you know, would reiterate the point that, you know, funding becomes much easier. It doesn't matter if on the debt or on the equity side. And maybe just to mention one factor, you know, what you see now is the implementation of the so-called ESG margin ratchets. So if you fulfill certain criteria, your financing costs will become cheaper. You know, that's actually put into practice now in quite a few deals. So it's, you know, one, one real life example. Great. Well, it's nice to end the session on opportunities. And I know we could have another whole session on opportunities there. There is um, gold on the other side of the hills. 
once you get your shoes on. So uh, thank you for joining us and um, stay with us for the next session. And thank you to Craig Davies, Emily Mazzucarati, and Kristen Bode. I'm Kathy Boffman McLeod. Thanks for your time today.